So let's see how it goes. So first we're going to put an order on this collection of sets, the cuts. Then we're going to show that this collection has a least upper bound property. Then we'll, we're going to define addition and multiplication and show that those satisfy the field axioms. Then we'll show that uh, once we've shown that it's a field, we'll show that it's, an, that it's an ordered field. And then that's it, we've done that. And then we have to embed the rationals into this set of reels and we'll be done. Okay. So, step two. Define an order relation. on the cuts. A subset, if one set is a subset of another, it means that that every element of A is in B. So if A is a subset, if A is a subset of B, it means that every element of A is in B. If it's a, if A is a proper subset of B, it means that there is some element of B that's not in A. So we have A here and then B here. So there's gonna be something over here. There's gonna be something that's in B that's not in A. So let me say, there's a confusion about the notation and it depends on the author. So some authors think that this symbol means subset, that this is A is a subset of B, but that when you say it's a subset, it only means this, that every element of A is in B. That means the two sets might be equal, or there might be something in B that's not an A, that's not clear from, from just stating that it's A subset. But then if it's a proper subset, That means that there is something in B that's not in A. They're not equal. So some authors use this to mean subset and they don't really have a symbol to mean proper subset. They just say proper subset. That's the way Rudin does it. And there's a lot to be, it, it makes sense to look at it that way because subset is just, it means that the, one, that the one sets inside the other. We don't need to know more about it than that. If we wanna say proper, we can say proper. But on the other hand, there's a, the other way of doing it is to say that A and then this symbol B means proper subset. And then A, and then if you want to say that it might be a proper subset or they might be equal, then you, you use basically like this plus an equal sign, proper or equal. So they both have advantages and there's some ambiguity. When you're reading a book, you need to figure out, you need to make sure you understand what the author means by it. Rudin does it this way, but I think that, actually, I know I'm gonna do it this way instead. So, because then there's an analogous, there's an analogy between uh, less than and less than and equal. So you can think of A as a proper subset, it's less than B in some way, whereas this means it might be, sub, might be less than or it might be equal to. We're going to define alpha less than beta to mean alpha is a proper subset of beta. Not, not equal, this means they're not equal, but alpha is a proper subset of beta. I just remembered, I forgot to tell you something here. When we're doing this proof, regular letters, P, Q, R, are elements of the rational numbers, alpha, beta, gamma, R, cuts. So I'll always use Greek letters to be in a cut and P, Q, and R to be elements of those cuts. Okay, okay, so alpha, so this is going to be our order. 
relation on our set R. So now we have to check to make sure that this fits the requirements of an ordering on a set. And those requirements are that if X is an element of a set S and Y is an element of a set S, then one and only one of these statements is true. Either x is less than y, x equals y, or x is greater than y. And then two, if x, y, and z are elements of s, and x is less than y, and y is less than z, then x is less than z. Okay, if these two things are true, then we've properly defined an order on our cuts. So the second one too is just, is pretty obvious that if alpha is less than beta and beta is less than gamma, then it's clear that alpha is less than gamma because a proper subset of a proper subset is a proper subset. So if you have three sets with alpha, beta, and gamma, this is a proper subset of this, this is a proper subset of this, then obviously alpha is a proper subset of gamma. Okay, that one's easy. So it's also clear that, that at most one of the three relations is true. Either alpha is less than beta, alpha equals beta, or alpha is greater than beta. So this is also obvious because this just means that you, they, there can't be two of them are, are true at the same time. Because if the two sets are equal, that means they have all the same elements. Well, then one can't be a proper subset because proper subset means that there's some element in beta that's not in alpha. On the other hand, if alpha is a proper subset of beta, that means by definition that there's some element of beta that's not in alpha, then they can't be, re they can't be equal. But we haven't proven yet that one of them will be because it's also possible that none of them are true, that there's just two of these cuts don't have any proper subset relation at all. So we need to show that in fact, they will be. So we need to show that for any two elements of R, at least one of them holds. Okay, so we're talking about these three. So let's just assume that these two fail. So if these two are not true, then we have, then it has to be that alpha is bigger than beta. So if these two fail, then alpha is not a subset of beta. But if alpha is not a subset of beta, then that means there exists a p element of alpha. Again, p means that it's a rational number. Alpha is a cut and one of the subsets. Uh, that there's a p element of alpha where p is not an element of beta. There must be, because if this weren't true, alpha would have to be a subset of beta. So if it's not a subset, that means there's something in alpha that's not in beta. If q is an element of beta, then Q has to be less than P. Why is this? This is the rule A, that if P is an alpha and Q is not an alpha, then P has to be less than Q. So here, what we have is that Q is in beta, but P is not in beta. So Q has to be less than P. And if you just think about it, so this is alpha, and then beta is here somewhere. Q is here. So if Q is in beta, but P is not in beta, then Q is gonna to have to be less than P. But we know from, from rule two that if P is an element of alpha and Q is even less than P, then Q has to be an alpha too. We started with just saying that Q is in beta, 
but now we've shown, therefore, Q is an element of A. So, in other words, what we showed was that if Q is an element of beta, then it, then it has to be an alpha. So if there's anything in beta, it has to be an alpha. That means that beta is less than or equal to, or is a subset of alpha. But we were, we started, we were given that beta does not equal alpha. So it has to be that beta is a proper subset of alpha, which means that alpha is greater than beta, okay? So we just showed that if these two are not true, then this one is true. We still need to show that if these two are not true, then they're gonna to have to be equal. So what if alpha is not less than beta, beta is not less than alpha. So that means that neither one of these is a proper subset of the other. We know from two that if there are any two cuts, one of them has to be a subset of the other because they all go all the way to the left. So whatever the, whatever the boundary is here, either one of, the, one of the sets is gonna be bigger than the other, or if not, there's only one choice left, which is that they share the elements. So that's easy to see. So with that, we've shown that for any two cuts, one of these and only one holds. So it's very interesting because now we have these sets and they're greater than, like if you take two elements, one is greater than the other or they're equal. But all we're really talking about is these sets and that one is a proper subset. But we're able to say that if it's a proper subset, that means it's less than the other one. So thus, R is an ordered set. Okay, so step three is to show that R has the least upper bound property. Now, this is also really interesting. The least upper bound property was, the, was one of the first things that we talked about. And what's really interesting about this property is all it requires is the ordering. If there's any set that has an order, then you can talk about whether or not it has the least upper bound property. Because what does the least upper bound mean? It just means that if a set is bounded, what's it mean to be bounded? Bounded just means that that there's some element that is larger than everything else in the set. And if it has a bound, then we can investigate whether it has the least upper bound property, which means any set that is bounded has a least upper bound. So the interesting thing is we're still not remotely talking about numbers here. We're only talking about sets, subsets, proper subsets, and so on. We've shown less than, equal than, equal to, greater than, only talking about proper subsets of these subsets of rational numbers. And yet now we're gonna show that these subsets of rational numbers not only have an order, but they have a least upper bound property. Already it's mind boggling what we're doing here because we're not even talking about numbers yet, we're just talking about subsets. And yet now we're gonna end up with a set that has a least upper bound property. So in order to do this, let A be a non-empty subset of R and assume that beta is an upper bound of A. So keep in mind what we're talking about here. A is a subset of R, but R is not a set of numbers. It itself is a set of subsets. So 
The elements of R are subsets of the rational numbers. Now we're talking about a set of those elements of R. Each one of those elements is itself a subset of the rational numbers. Okay, keep that in mind. And then so if this, if we have a non-empty subset of R, then we're assuming that, there, that it has an upper bound, which we're calling beta. Next we'll define gamma to be the union of all alpha in A. Okay, so, alpha, so A has some number of these sets. It's bounded from above, so we're going to take all the elements of A and take a union of those elements and call that gamma. So the important thing to understand there is that, again, gamma is itself a subset of the rational numbers because we took a bunch of subsets of rational numbers, took the union of those cuts of those subsets, and we're making a new subset of rational numbers. So now we have some subset of rational numbers that was formed by the union of these subsets of rational numbers, of the cuts, okay? So it's the union of all of the subsets that are elements of A. So in other words, P is an element of gamma, if and only if P is an element of alpha for some alpha in A. So we're just saying that if, if there's a rational number that is an element of, the, of gamma, it has to be a member of some alpha in A because gamma is just the union of all of the alphas. So it has to belong to some alpha. We shall prove that first that gamma is an element of, of the real numbers. In, or, in other words, that gamma itself is one of these cuts and that gamma is the supremum of A. So what we're showing is that for, that's what the least upper bound property is. For any set of elements in R that's bounded, it has a supremum. So we're gonna show that there is a supremum. We're gonna make the supremum show that this is that supremum. So we have to do two things. First, we have to show that gamma is an element of R. Then we need to show that gamma is the supremum of A. So first, we need to show that gamma is an element of R. So again, in order to do that, we just need the three, we have to show that gamma satisfies the three, the three rules for cuts. So, can we remember them? One is that alpha is not empty and alpha is not all of Q. Two is that if P is an element of alpha and Q is, any, is some rational number and Q is less than P, then Q is also an element of alpha. Three, if P is an element of alpha, then P is less than R for some R element of alpha. So we started with, we were given that A is non-empty. That means that there exists some alpha zero element of A. A has some element, which we'll call alpha zero. Furthermore, alpha zero is not empty because it's a cut, and one of the rules of a cut is that it's not empty. And therefore, since alpha zero is a subset of gamma, because gamma is the union of all of the elements of, al of A, since alpha zero is a subset of gamma, then gamma must not be empty. So 
So that's the first part. Gamma is not empty. Next, gamma is a subset of beta. Remember, we started by saying that A is bounded and beta is, is a boundary of A. So gamma is a subset of beta because every alpha, by definition, if beta is a boundary of A, then every member of A, every alpha in A, has to be less than beta. That's what it means for, for A to be bounded. So since gamma is the union of those alphas, then gamma also has to be a subset of beta. So if gamma is less than or equal to beta, and beta, again, is a cut, beta is not the rational numbers. Gamma is a subset of beta, so gamma is also not all of the rational numbers. It's something smaller than the rational numbers. Okay, so that was number one. We showed that gamma is not empty, and we showed that gamma is not all of Q. So to prove two and three, pick some element of gamma. Pick P element of gamma. So for two, if P is an element of gamma, then P is an element of alpha one for some alpha one in A. So if Q, if there's a Q element of, we're just doing two here, if Q is an element of the rationals such that Q is less than P, then Q is an element of alpha one, right? That's just two. But so if Q is an element of alpha one, then Q is an element of gamma, and this proves two. So we just showed that if P is an element of gamma, then there's, there's some alpha. P is an element of some alpha. But if it's an element of an alpha, then if there's a Q that's less than P, it's gonna be in the alpha, then Q is also gonna be an alpha. But if Q is in the alpha, so we showed that there's a Q that if Q is less than P, it's also an alpha. But since alpha one is a subset of gamma, that means the Q has to also be in gamma. So we just showed that if there's a P in gamma and Q less than P, then Q has to also be in gamma. So gamma satisfies the second property. So three is that if there's an element in gamma, then there's still gonna be something bigger that's still in gamma. So there's gonna to have to be an R in alpha one, same alpha one. There has to be an R in alpha one. So we, we're gonna choose R in alpha one so that um, R is greater than P. So this is just, we already know this because alpha one is a cut. So if, if P is in alpha one, then there's going to be an R that's also in alpha one that's greater than P. But then that R is in alpha one so R is also an element of gamma, but that's what we wanted to show, that we started with there's a P in gamma, and then we show that because that P is in alpha one, then there's gonna be an R that's in alpha one, but that alpha one is all in gamma, so R is gonna be in gamma two. That's what we needed to show, so that's three. So that's it, one, two, and three. So what we just showed is that gamma is a cut. Gamma is an element of the real numbers. So we have one thing left to show. So we showed that gamma is an element of R. Now we have to show that gamma is the least upper bound of A. Okay, and then we're done. So it is clear that alpha is less than or equal to gamma for every alpha in A. So this is obviously true because gamma is the union of all of the alphas that are in A. So every alpha is a subset of gamma. So that's all that we need. That means that from our definition of less than, that gamma is greater than or equal to every element of A. That means that gamma is a boundary. So we've at least shown that gamma is 
an upper bound of, of A, now we need to show that in fact, it's the least upper bound. So this is really cool. If you remember how hard it was for us to prove that our, num that our root was the least upper bound in our proof of the roots, this is so simple and elegant, it's really cool. So suppose we have a delta that's less than gamma. So we have delta that's less than gamma. That means that delta is a proper subset of gamma. That means that then there is an S element of gamma where S is not an element of delta, right? Because this is just bigger, so there's going to be something in gamma that's not in delta. Since S is an element of gamma, S has to be an element of alpha for some alpha in A, right? So that means that since S is an element of, of gamma, there has to be an alpha that contains S. But we just said that S is not in delta. That means that there exists an element of gamma. That means that there exists an element of alpha that is not in delta. That means that delta has to be less than alpha also. But if delta is less than alpha, then then delta cannot be an upper bound of A because there's some alpha in A that is bigger than delta. So what we did was, if delta is anything less than gamma, it cannot be an upper bound of A. That is another way of saying that gamma must be the least upper bound of A, because anything smaller than gamma can't be an upper bound. So we just showed that, therefore, gamma equals the supremum of A. So with this, we just proved that this set has the least upper bound property because we took for any bounded set of elements of R, if it's bounded, then we just showed how we can make a least upper bound so that every bounded, every set bounded from above in the real numbers has a least upper bound. So our system here of cuts has the least upper bound property. Okay, great. So starting next video, we'll start on step four, which is to do the field axioms, and then we'll do the ordered field, and then we'll embed the rationals in the reals, and then we'll be done. Thank you. Okay, here is the link to the first video in this chapter. Here is the link to the previous video. Here is the link to the next video. And click here to subscribe and please join me on Patreon. The link to that is below in the description. Thank you.